All right, thank you so much, uh, all of you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to see uh, so many people logged in. Um, this is the second event in the Spring 2021 Forest Speaker Series as sponsored by the Humanities Center at Texas Tech. I am the director of the Humanities Center at Texas Tech, Michael Borshuk, and I'm also an associate professor uh, in the Department of English. Uh, I'm just going to make a couple of quick announcements before I turn things over to tonight's host and moderator. Um, first off, um, we're especially mindful of all of the people across the state of Texas who are struggling or in real danger tonight. Um, and we hope that there's uh, a speedy resolution to this ongoing crisis. Um, also, I would um, ask you um, uh, to keep your microphones muted throughout uh, John Feldman's presentation tonight, but there will be uh, plenty of time at the end of his presentation to, um, to ask uh, questions and participate in discussion with our moderator. Um, a couple of quick announcements uh, related to the Humanities Center. First off, um, I would uh, urge you to go and register for all of our remaining events under the forest theme uh, this semester. Uh, coming up, we have two events each in March and April. So after tonight, our next event will be Self-Portrait with Dogwood, a conversation with Christopher Merrill, who I think is, is here tonight. He's been, he's been a, a ever-present guest at our uh, series events and um, look forward to his conversation on March 4th. Um, all of our events are at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, they're all on Thursday evenings and you can register at the Humanities Center website, humanitycenter.ttu.edu um, under the events tab. You can also follow us on social media. Uh, all of our social media accounts are listed there. Um, and I urge you to go uh, subscribe if you're a social media user. You can also look us up on YouTube. The Humanities Center at Texas Tech has a YouTube channel and we have been archiving all of the forest events this year. And uh, this one will be up there soon in the next couple of days um, after tonight. Uh, so there are many different ways to stay on top of all of the events that we sponsor at the Humanity Center at Texas Tech and uh, encourage you to, uh, to look into those. Before I turn things over to tonight's host, I just wanted to read as always our land acknowledgement statement. The Humanity Center at Texas Tech opens its officially sponsored events with an acknowledgement of the indigenous people on whose lands we host our talks and gatherings. The center opens its events with this gesture as part of our commitment to respecting the shared humanity of different populations across diverse cultural traditions and to remembering with clarity the complex and violent truths of our history. With that in mind, we acknowledge the sacred grounds on which we stand, the traditional homelands of the Apache tribe of Oklahoma, the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, the Comanche Nation, the Hickorya Apache Nation, the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma, and the Mescalero Apache Tribe of the Mescalero Reservation. We pay respect to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, trauma, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. With those announcements out of the way, I'd like to turn things over to my colleague in the English department, Dr. Bruce Clark, who is a Horn Professor of Literature and Science and the lead programmer of the Forest theme all year long. And Bruce will be our host and moderator for tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And hello, everybody. Sure is good to see you there. Uh, I'm just going to take a moment to situate uh, this evening's event in uh, context of the series that we've been doing all year long. Uh, in 2020 and 21, the annual theme for our Humanity Center here at Texas Tech has been forests. We think that in order to be fully human at this moment requires an understanding of what it means to be of this earth, not the masters, but participants in living communities bound up with enmeshed in the earth system in relation to this realization, forest ecosystems demonstrate in close up how the earth system at large keeps all life going. So all this academic year through pandemic and now blizzard, we have been thinking about forests, what they are, how they work, how we have always lived in their shadow, under their shade, even while we took them for granted, and why their preservation at this moment truly matters. 
we have been thinking with forests in order to come to grips with the contemporary state of the biosphere at large and how we humans as beneficiaries and consumers of forests might learn from the trees how to make positive differences in face of the ecological challenges we currently confront. So last fall, the forest series focused on the natural and social sciences of forests, with speakers discussing topics ranging from the origin, evolution, and ecology of forests to indigenous forest cuisines and forest restoration based on indigenous cultural practices. This spring, the forest series focuses on the arts and humanities with presentations, as you just saw, by poets, photographers, legal scholars, forest regeneration activists, and tonight, an acclaimed filmmaker who has been turning his creative attention and advocacy to the planetary role of forests. So our guest tonight, our speaker, John Feldman, is a critically acclaimed filmmaker whose work ranges from independent dramatic features to nature documentaries. John's most recent film is Symbiotic Earth, uh, which came out in 2018, a documentary about the evolutionary thinker Lynn Margulis. And tonight, John will take us into his current project, Regenerating Life, a feature-length documentary in progress, examining a growing movement of farmers, activists, and scientists working to repair environmental and social devastations. John will highlight, as he goes along tonight, his research for this film into the ways that trees and forests are key components of the planet's water cycles. Please join me then in welcoming John Feldman. Yay. Okay, John, okay. you're on. Thank you so much. So um, I want to uh, first thank you for having me here um, and just give you a little rundown of what I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to start and talk a little bit about water, because I think that in order to understand the role of forests, um, we really have to understand the importance of water. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how I got into this situation of, of making this film uh, and share a few of the kind of intellectual dilemmas that, that I have stumbled across. And then I want to talk about how trees are crucial to bringing fresh water onto the land and crucial to uh, controlling the temperature of our planet. Um, so first, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen here. And I'm going to show you a very cool shot. And it's silent, but you can watch it. It's 45 seconds. Can you hear me if, when I'm talking now? So we all know what this is. This is water. This is slowed down 24 times. And this is actually what you're looking at. So the interesting thing about water, um, and the reason I want to start with that is that, you know, everybody knows that water is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. It's in all of us. It covers 70 some percent of the uh, planet. Um, and, and yet there's very little fresh water. 90, I think it's 97% of the earth um, so the Earth's water is in the ocean. And then of the remaining 3%, which is fresh water, 2% is in the glaciers, and only 1% is uh, in fresh water. And that includes the atmosphere, the soil, the trees, the plants, our bodies, the streams, the lakes, and so forth. Um, and 
when we when we think about how the earth cools itself um and i want to backtrack for a moment to say that the film is essentially about climate change and i'll get into that for a moment um but when we think about how the earth cools itself um something that we don't often do um it all comes down to water um and most of that water is in the atmosphere but there's a funny thing that happens if you were to go online or go to a textbook or remember your uh, um, you know, uh, last uh, class in atmospheric conditions um, and ask, well, what's in the atmosphere? You'd find out that 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, 21% of the atmosphere is oxygen, and 1% is everything else. And of that 1%, 0.9% uh, is a gas called argon, and the rest is lots of other gases. Um, and everybody tends to remember that uh, CO2 is four one hundredths of 1%. So a tiny, tiny amount. And you think about that for a moment and you say, so that's interesting. And then you say, well, wait a minute, where's water? We know that water's in the atmosphere all the time. Water's everywhere. Um, and in fact, any uh, paper um, and even these charts that I, you know, you, you find online will tell you that water is anywhere from one or a little less than 1% to up to 5% of the atmosphere. So why doesn't anybody talk about that? Um, and the answer to that question is the answer is the same answer to another question, um, which is, um, if you were to look into it, you would find that water is by far the most dominant greenhouse gas. The, the, the calculations vary, but it's somewhere around 70% of the greenhouse gases, maybe 80% of the greenhouse gases are water. But in all of these conversations about water, I mean about the climate change and the greenhouse gas effect, nobody mentions water. And the reason for both of these things is that water is just too complex. It's just too complex. Um, and when they did the studies of what's in the atmosphere, they find out that um, water varies so much um, that in order to get a percentage, they do their calculations on dry air. Nobody is hiding this, but in order to get a good percentage, a number that they can, you know, they can hold, um, they do the calculations on dry air. And if you look at the papers, the famous papers, um, which are used now to really, uh, uh, used as evidence, incorrectly used as evidence, uh, that uh, climate uh, change is caused by CO2, you'll see that those scientists who made those mathematical models just couldn't include water because it was way too complicated. And they concentrated on their mandate, which was CO2. Um, and then in some of the good papers, they do include water, um, but they include it as a secondary factor. They decided that they would call water a secondary factor. And there are good reasons for doing this, but none of those, in my opinion, are forgivable. Um, so water is everywhere, and um, that's kind of an introduction to um, uh, this, this, the dilemma that I find myself in, um, in that, so I made this film Symbiotic Earth, which is about the great scientist Lynn Margulis, and I learned a lot from making that film, a hell of a lot from making that film, and Lynn taught me, among other things, that when we look into any scientific problem, we have to go back to the basics. You know, most science is, is like a built one level so that scientists are working at the top of knowledge and trying to advance knowledge. Um, but they don't go back very far. They build on their predecessors. Um, and Lynn said, no, you've got to go all the way back and start over again. 
because only by doing that are you going to find a new path, a new type of discovery. I mean, one of the things she came up with was what's called the Gaia theory, which hopefully you guys know about. Um, and the Gaia theory proposes that the uh, temperature of Earth and by extension the climate on Earth is regulated by the system of life itself, that the system of life regulates its own climate. And that's, you know, kind of an amazing proposition if you think about it. Um, so I took that as my starting point for this film and I said, okay, how does the system of life regulate the climate? Um, and um, I began to, to study and, and you know, what's, what's amazing about, this is a little aside, but what's amazing about my, uh, about being a filmmaker um, and, the, and the kind of the position I take as I move along is that it's a really a learning adventure for me. Um, in fact, in Symbiotic Earth and also in my new film, that learning adventure is going to be kind of the narrative structure of the film so that I, I am going to narrate it in the first person and I um, kind of tell the story of how I began to unravel the mystery, as it were. Um, so I decided to, to kind of look at what really controls the climate. And along the way, um, I met lots of incredible people, lots of people, and it turned out that I wasn't the first person to, you know, obviously, I wasn't the first person to have started to do this. And one of the people who I met, and I want to show you a little clip of him, was a man, Walter Yaney. And Walter Yaney is an Australian uh, atmospheric scientist and a biologist and so forth. Um, and um, he, I went to a lecture of his, his and he really... Uh, turned me around. And he primarily turned me around by pointing out the power of water. And that just as we humans both regulate our temperature through water, the earth also regulates its temperature with water. Um, so I spent two weeks with him in the mountains of Vermont studying the, uh, the climate. And we had some great Great stuff. So I just want to show you something here. This is a minute and a half. I might not play the whole thing. Climate change is upon us. It's actually impacting now. It's intensifying now. And of course, there's this disconnect between what we're hearing. Here is CO2 rising. Here's a greenhouse effect. But what we're experiencing are actually on the ground, increased variation, increased extremes, particularly in these hydrological or water-related processes. Hurricanes, floods, storms, droughts, the whole aridification of vast regions, and with it, aridification, wildfires. And so we've got to step back behind that to say, well, why these extremes? And what we've, in a sense, lost critically lost is the actual buffering and regulation that previously used to exist in the climate. Okay, so what buffered and regulated these right. extremes and gave us predictability. And so then we go back to, again, the basics of climatology 101, and that simply says, yes, it is water that governs 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet, Earth. Water. And it's the dynamics. And see, when we talk about extremes, it's the dynamics of those extremes. It's not the averages. But it's the buffering capacity of the planet. I'm going to stop there because he goes on. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm back. Um, so he goes on, and 
when I first heard Walter and he began to, you know, to, to ask a simple question, when we look at what's going on um, in what we call climate change, it's all about water. And not only is it all about water, it's all about these extremes. It's these extremes. And what, what you're experiencing in, in Texas right now is really an extreme. And it's, it's, so it really has nothing to do with the averages. It has to do with these extremes. And it's those extremes that are causing all the damage. Um, and so the more I began to look into this, um, the more I realized that the solutions to the uh, climate crisis um, were really um, all in line with the solutions to all of our crises, really. Um, and kind of the, to cut to the chase um, before we get into trees is that the, the, the thesis of the film, which I'm working on now, which is called Regenerating Life, the thesis of the film is that the cause of all these crises is the destruction of life. Um, the living system that sustains us, the living system that controls the climate. Uh, for centuries, really since the dawn of man, we have been destroying the, the climate, I'm sorry, we have been destroying the environment. Um, and w this has accelerated after the industrial age, but w I'm going to show you a little clip in a little while. It didn't start with the industrial age. We were destroying things way back when. Um, and um, this destruction is the problem. And the destruction, and this gets back to symbiotic earth a little bit, the destruction that's happening now, and probably the destruction that happened in the past, was because we humans, and I guess I should say that we, um, the people who call ourselves civilized, we have this idea that success and wealth comes from extracting wealth from the land. And in this film, I'm also going to point out that we have this idea that success comes from extracting wealth from the land and the people. And whether it's colonialism or corporate uh, corporate colonialism, um, we have a model of success based on taking from the land. And one of the first things we did was destroy forests. Forests um, were burnt, um, as, you know, probably uh, as soon as man developed agriculture, we began to burn the forests. Um, so um, I want to show you now um, now before I do that before I do that um, I want to explain a little bit about the biotic pump um, and because I, things are getting a little vague here um, so Humans, we sweat, and when that water evaporates from our skin, um, it requires 590 calories per cubic centimeter, a gram. Um, and that cools us, and we all know this. Um, and trees do the same thing. Trees transpire, and they draw water up from their roots, into their body and out their leaves and they have these little stomata which open up and water vapor uh, is released there and in order for that water vapor in order for the water to have turned into water vapor took the same amount 590 calories um, so trees are really the air conditioners on land um, but it goes but it goes further, like an advertisement. It goes on. Um, and as the tree transpires this water, 
the water goes up and condenses and it condenses as clouds and as it condenses as cloud it releases that 590 calories per gram and that goes out to outer space now not all of it goes out and the root from the tree transpiring to the rain coming down is just incredibly complex because the vapor turns to water and remember um, anytime you can see water in the air it's liquid water it's not water vapor so rain and fog and everything like snow that's liquid water um, but anyway so as the condensation happens it creates a low pressure area um, below the, the cloud, right, above the tree line. And that sucks in moist air from the ocean. And that's called the biotic pump. Um, and not only does it suck moist air in from the ocean, but when you ask the question, okay, but how does the moisture, how does the water get inland? How is it possible that we have these incredible rivers and forests, you know, thousands of miles from the ocean? Where did that water come? Um, and, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and that's because there's a, there's a shuttling, if you will, that the area next to the uh, kind of the first forest, it also transpires and moves the water further along. And then further inland, it moves more water further along. So this idea is, is actually, it's, um, it's somewhat controversial, um, but um, it, it seems, everywhere I look, it seems to be borne out by, by evidence. So um, just from those two examples, the transpiration of trees and the biotic pump, you can see how crucial trees are to the um, uh, to the movement of water through our planet. Uh, so I want to now show you something, and I got to share my screen again. Now, um, uh, before I do so, so I mean this is kind of cool because I'm able to show you my editing software as if you come into the come into the editing room. Um, which I don't usually do, but it's kind of exciting. And so what I'm showing you is a rough cut of a chapter, I think it's about six minutes long, um, about the trees. Um, and chances are when the film is done, you won't even recognize this. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's there in essence. And of course, it doesn't have any music, which it will have. But I think it's worthwhile to see. Um, It's actually seven minutes long. It's time to speak in praise of trees. Since the dawn of man, trees have given us fuel, food, medicine, shelter, cities, ships, and empires. Trees provide food and oxygen for vast forest ecosystems, cooling the planet, bringing fresh moist air in from the ocean, circulating water, and preventing forest fires. We cannot live without trees. These hills on the Pacific coast were once covered in giant redwoods. The trees were used to build San Francisco. Black spruce and Norway pine, Douglas fir and red cedar, scarlet oak and shagbark hickory, hemlock and aspen. There was lumber in the north. Heads up, lumber on the upper river. 
Heads up. Lumber enough to cover all Europe. Down from Minnesota and Wisconsin. Down to St. Paul. Down to St. Louis and St. Joe. Lumber for the new continent of the West. Lumber for the new mill. This boreal forest, filmed by Greenpeace many years ago, was an essential part of the global climate control system. We had forests over most of the land's surface releasing water, forming these hydrological cycles and cooling. And it's these cycles that we've actually influenced and disturbed significantly through our land management. Whereas there were 8 billion hectares of primary forests, we've cleared 6.3 billion hectares of those. So that's 78% of the Earth's original forests that we have destroyed. Some is regenerated as in New England, but we have fundamentally changed those hydrological dynamics of the planet. And that has contributed significantly to the changes in its temperature and its rainfall patterns. In Britain, Stephen Harding introduced me to this 2,000-year-old yew tree. It was probably planted here, but it's possible that it was part of the original forest. Conceivable that it was part of the original forest. And, and it's conceivable that it was considered to be uh, a very sacred tree. Britain is one of the great deforestation headquarters on the planet. When I go on the train, you know, between here and London, I, try, I'm, I, have, I find it very hard not to cry. When you think what was here before, it was mostly oak forest with meadows here and there full of huge wild cattle called aurochs. There were wolves, there were bears, there were lynxes, there were beavers, I mean, it's, there were eagles. The richness and diversity and sacredness of the forest that was here was just mind-blowing. And gradually, 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 over thousands of years, that forest was cut down bit by bit. And every generation thought, oh, what we've got now is normal. It's called shifting baseline syndrome. Every generation degrades the environment a little bit, and they think it's normal. And the next generation degrades it a bit more, and then they think it's normal. You end up with this kind of absolute disaster. And of course, we've exported this way of dealing with nature to the rest of the world, not just the British, but all the Northern Europeans who colonized different parts of the world have exported that sort of nature-hating mentality to the rest of the planet. When I asked about the forests of Andhra Pradesh, one of the driest states in India, Vijay Kumar told a similar story. More than uh, 600 years ago, it was a very good forest. Was that most of this area that we drove through to get here, yeah. was that mostly forest? Yes, this was a very green area, plenty of water. Historically, they write about, you know, a lot of elephants and a lot of wildlife in this area. So it is uh, the gradual deforestation, the, you know, clearing of forests for uh, crops and, you know, commercial deforestation. Was most of India? forest at one time? Whole world. The whole world. <laughs> In Rome, I filmed this beautiful cedar tree, one of the legendary cedars of Lebanon. These trees were coveted for building ships. Rumor has it that Noah built his ark from cedars of Lebanon. One of the last remaining groves of these cedars, called the Cedars of God, 
stands in Lebanon at this red dot. This entire area, including the Sahara Desert, was once green with forests, woodlands, and savannas. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Niger. Here are some speculative illustrations of what Libya once looked like. Okay, the Sahara is a hard case because, yes, Why you are that? right, it was this exquisite savanna woodland up to about 7,000 years ago. We massively overgrazed it, massively aridified it, massively burnt it. So flip back to mineral desert. Life was extinguished. No water, no life. We need to take utmost care of the forest that remains because it is of crucial importance for our modern civilization. It does a very important work, which we have at the moment don't quite appreciate. The vast forests of Europe, the Mideast, Africa, Asia, Australia, and now the Americas were appreciated, honored, worshipped, and destroyed. I appreciate and honor this tree as I watch it burning to warm my home this morning. But still I burn it. So, um, Wait a minute. I have to stop the share. Okay, I'm back. Um, so we can talk about that later. One of the issues that I'm scratching my head over is whether to, as, as you can see, that whole sequence is, has this ironic tone to it, of course. And so in the end, I asked, you know, I point out that you know, I'm burning this this tree, um, and I'm kind of wondering whether I should go there because it's a it's a very complicated conversation and might take me uh, way off track in the film. Um, but you know, when you begin to understand um, how important trees are for the uh, climate of our planet and the importance is that they are really the circulation system of the water we think that the circulation system are the rivers and streams that go down to the ocean and then the clouds come across and they drop rain and then it goes back down to the streams and the lakes and goes back to the ocean that's called the large water cycle but the other water cycle, um, the one that is really much more important to to us and to the uh, uh, to the uh, environment, is a small water cycle, which is the water going from the roots up the trees, out the leaves to the clouds, and then down as rain. And in places like the Amazon. Um, the same water can be cycled again and again. Um, I've never been there or seen that, but you know, apparently you can set your watch by the water coming down. And this water cools because it's taking that heat up. Um, and of course it feeds the soil. Um, and it feeds the soil so all this other life can grow. Um, and so you simply have to ask yourself, so if you take away all the trees, is it any wonder that the planet is overheating? Um, and, you know, I, I, I hope that that, that uh, becomes clear from this film. Um, and I, I now want to turn my attention to, to kind of some of the dilemmas that I'm facing here, because of course, the, the standard narrative is that uh, the increase in CO2 in the greenhouse gas layer has caused the uh, global warming. Um, that's become a dogma in our, in our culture. It, it's almost as if no one has ever stopped to question it. 
Um, and yet there are lots of people questioning it. Um, and those are the people that I like to talk to. Um, and, but I just want you to think about this for a moment. The, the, uh, how the life regulates the temperature on the planet is very complex. There's a couple warming processes. And remember, the, the sun is what, you know, heats us up. Um, but we do have an insulating layer to keep from freezing. And one of those is the greenhouse effect. And that's uh, crucial. Um, but there are other ways that the planet warms itself. And then there are cooling processes. And all of these involve water. So it's really incredibly, it's mind bogglingly complex. But what's happened is we focused on one of those, the greenhouse effect. And we say, aha, the greenhouse effect warms the planet. And then we've looked at the greenhouse gases and we've narrowed it down to one of those greenhouse gases, which is CO2. Um, and we've saying, aha, the greenhouse gases are increasing. I mean, this, I'm sorry, the CO2 is increasing. Um, and that's because we burn too much fossil fuel. Um, and so we've narrowed it down further to the burning of fossil fuels, because a lot of that CO2 that goes into the atmosphere doesn't come from the burning of, of, uh, of fossil fuels or carbon emissions. In fact, there's more CO2 put into the atmosphere every year by fires, particularly fires when they burn fields fires when they burn fields, forest fires, and so forth. More CO2 goes into the atmosphere from that than from um, um, carbon emissions. Um, and so, but we've decided that, well, if it's fossil fuels, the, the solution is to move to renewable energy, um, to cut emissions and move to renewable energy. And so the dialogue has narrowed down the problem so much so um, that we're all scrambling to try to cut our emissions and change our energy infrastructure. And by the way, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that the proposed solution to the climate crisis is actually the solution to the energy crisis that was developed by Carter years ago, right? But that's, that's in one of the chapters of my film. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, not surprising that in all of our efforts, we haven't um, changed uh, the, the global warming um, one iota. Um, and there have been many reasons for that failure, but um, we haven't looked elsewhere. And so as I began to look elsewhere, I found that not only is the forest a big issue, but the other issue is agriculture, and in particular, the soil. Um, and I'm not going to go into that now, it's a little bit off topic, but um, the soil, as most of you know, um, is full of life, full of life. And that, um, that life um, creates, a, a, if you've ever looked at good soil, it's like a sponge, it's got lots of little air in it. Um, and that incredible soil holds water and that holds the water. And that's the buffer that Walter is talking about. It holds that water so that when the rain comes down, the water is there available to the trees. Um, but we've plowed the land and we've put so many uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and poisons and we've essentially killed the soil. And so that the soil no longer holds water over vast areas of the earth. Um, and this doesn't even take into account all the concrete we've laid down so that the water just runs off. And so you have these tremendous storms and then these tremendous floods and then they're followed by drought because the water won't stay there. And then it's followed by forest fires. 
So all of this is about water. Um, so, and I just want to wrap up by saying that, you know, it's, it's, it, it's tricky because um, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to get into arguments about CO2 versus water, you know, in, in that way, because it's all a system and every part of a system is important. So yes, CO2 is important. And, um, you know, yes, water is important. Yes, the soil is important. And so it's all, it's all a system. But I find myself up against this. And it's interesting. Another little thing I just want to mention is that, so as I began to travel, I realized that there were lots of people um, who were on the case and they were doing all sorts of uh, sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture and so forth. But there were a couple words that they kept using. Uh, and um, draw down and sequester. And there's this image which is now becoming quite uh, uh, accepted and used. The trees draw down carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it in the soil. And that this is what we have to use to solve uh, climate change. And of course, I'm saying, yes, that's it. You know, we got to have more trees. We got to have more plants. Um, but then people began to take these words literally and to think that, well, what a tree does is it somehow sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere and hides it away in the soil someplace. Um, and these words draw down and sequester as they're taken further and further out, out of context, um, they really distort the whole issue. And in fact, you can imagine, and I'm sure you've all read about this, uh, people might think, oh, I know what we have to do. We have to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and stick it away someplace. So there are these companies that are creating these great big machines to draw it down and draw down the, uh, to suck down the, the carbon dioxide and put it in the ground. Um, and this is, this is ludicrous. And it's, it's ludicrous because somehow they've gotten into their heads that that's what trees do. But of course, we all know that this is not what trees do. Trees create sugars, food for all of life. And they don't sequester that that, that food in the ground, the life eats it and builds itself and builds the tree and builds us and builds all these things. And it holds that carbon, that biomass in the ground. Um, and the more of that we have, the more we, um, um, the, the more we, uh, we can get the water flowing again. And when we get the water flowing again, we can start to cool down the planet more. So, but the problem is that these people who are using the term drawdown and sequester, they're my colleagues. They're, they're, they're the people who are really, um, you know, fighting the good fight as it were. They're the ones who are, you know, uh, promoting regenerative agriculture and talking about planting more trees and so forth and so on. Um, so it's, it's a kind of an interesting dilemma. And the so, solution that I kind of come up with um, is, first of all, not to talk too much, um, but is that if I can explain um, to, you know, the audience, basically, how water cools the planet and how the system of life works, and if I can explain it well enough, by the time we get to the question of CO2, which at the moment is like two thirds into the film, it'll be obvious that this CO2 narrative is so limiting. And I won't have to make the arguments because I will have made, created my narrative. Um, so, um, uh, what else did I want to say? So, and, 
the only other thing I wanted to say, which I have here on my little list, is that the um, the beauty of this type of, of, of work that I'm doing is that I'm continually learning these things and talking to people and exchanging ideas with lots of people. Um, and I'm often asked the question, so, okay, John, you know, you and your big ideas, what, what would you do? Um, what should people be doing right now? Um, you know, because there's a lot of, of, of uh, worry about the climate. Um, and people are, you know, calling it an existential threat. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they're really afraid of, but um, there certainly a fears. Um, and so I, you know, I've decided that there's really two things. Um, one is we have to stop cutting down the forests. We have to stop cutting down the forests. Every day, forests are cut down. Um, and, um, and it's not just Brazil, it's the Siberian Eurasian forests, the, the, uh, the, uh, the forests in North America, um, Northern, Northern Canada, um, the uh, uh, forests in uh, Northern Australia, uh, and the Congo, the forests around the Congo. These areas are losing trees. I, I, I'm sure the, the number, I don't know the number, but I'm sure the number is outstanding, you know, how many trees are lost every day. And there's this notion, and it's a terrible thing that I just actually learned about. Um, by the way, that woman, that Russian woman in the, in the tree film, the tree section, that's the woman who really developed the biotic pump theory. Amazing stuff. And she was pointed out a couple things to me. She pointed out, first of all, that it's only the old growth forests, these old forests that have like 100 years or so, you know, or more, probably 200 years, um, at least, that have the, the biotic pump potential, that really suck in the air. And I imagine that's because they're, they're really an, a, such a rich ecosystem with such root, a rich roots and such an incredible array of fungi that somehow they, uh, they pump in more, more water. Um, but one of the things that happened, and this is going to be my last thing, was that the IPCC decided that forests were a, a sustainable commodity so that a, a company uh, could cut down trees and replant them. And if you planted a tree, you could plant trees like a crop and they would grow to be 60 years old and then you cut them down again and you plant some more. And that was considered acceptable. Um, and that's what's happening, I know, to the forests in British Columbia, um, the old growth forests there. They're cutting them down, um, you know, according to this understanding, and they're using them for wood pellets. Um, and it's just disastrous because it's, you, you, a forest is not a bunch of trees, um, and it's certainly not a monoculture of trees. It's, it's this incredible rich ecosystem. So that would be the first thing I would say is we have to stop uh, cutting forests. It's like now, right? Um, and the second is we really have to transition our agriculture um, away from killing the soil, away from the pesticides and the uh, um, uh, herbicides and all the things that kill the soil um, and transition towards some form of regenerative agriculture. And one of the big questions I constantly asked when I traveled was, you know, can you feed the world with small farms? And the answer is, we already are feeding the world with small farms. The commodities that are grown, as you in Texas well know, the commodities are mostly not food. And they're certainly not food for humans. Um, so that's a very hopeful thought that if we could transition our agriculture and start to grow food uh, in some regenerative or ecological way, then we could, um, you know, not only create soil that would hold the water 
which would decrease the floods, which would get the cooling water cycle going. Um, but we'd have better food and we'd have lower health care costs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I'm going to end it. All that stuff is in the film, by the way. You'll have to come and see it when it's done, which will be someday. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, see, and I'm right on time. Look at that, 930. Okay, John, thank you. Bravo. That was, uh, that oh, was place. just a wonderful, prickly, <laughs> informative. Uh, uh, so listen, uh, so I'm the moderator at this point, me and Hermes here who's joined the uh, joined us uh, for the Q&A. Um, uh, let me just say, uh, as you can tell, we're in gallery mode. And so basically anyone who wants to make a comment or, or ask John a question, uh, uh, you could just do it. You don't need to go to the chat necessarily. Uh, uh, and uh, but just if I, I'd ask you then, just just raise your little hand function on the Zoom, and I'll try to uh, keep an eye on that, and then just um, uh, take down names and and uh, uh, and then throw it to people as uh, 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 in turn as much as possible. Um, okay, so I, I think that should work all right. Um, but I'm going to take the privilege of my position now to ask the first couple of questions, uh, and then and then we'll just um, uh, throw it out to the uh, uh, to the audience. So, John, uh, I want to ask ask you a question about uh, the problematics of filmmaking. The problematics specific to this documentary that you're working on right now. The impression, one of the impressions I got as you kind of brought out your, you know, decision processes uh, in, in making a film like this is, um, uh, you might call it the problem of polemical posture. <laughs> and I kind of got a sense in this presentation tonight, you were taking the opportunity to vent just a little bit. Uh, as things that wouldn't necessarily end up in the final movie. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the issues are so dire, you know, if, if you just, you know, I mean, they're just dire. Um, and, and, and misunderstandings need to be corrected. And, and you've got very strong ideas about that. How, how do you negotiate that but then you just don't want your your movie to be a rant <laughs> so, from beginning to end. So how how do you negotiate that? Is there any formula, or just make it up as you go along? Um, well, I wouldn't say there's a formula. Um, so you know, I mean, I have to. I I, I felt myself getting up on this soapbox. But as you know, it's really weird to do this Zoom thing because I get no feedback, right? Um, and so I just get kind of work myself up, you know? Uh, but um, it's true, it's very frustrating because as when you start to look into it and you start to realize that the whole climate change narrative is essentially wrong. Um, and it's like, well, whoa, 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 who am I to be saying that the whole climate change narrative is wrong? I mean, right? Um, and yet, and so, and, and every day you read something and they're saying that, you know, well, it's solid science that, you know, carbon emissions cause global warming. That's solid science. Well, the truth is there is no solid science about carbon dioxide causing global warming. It's simply some really good mathematical models. Um, but that's taken as dogma. And we have a terrible thing happening in our culture now, and it's scientism. And I don't even know if I'm going to go into that in the film. But this, this idea that science um, uh, creates truths, and that you believe those truths without question. Um, and that's not at all 
and, and no science would say that's what science is, right? That's a popular understanding. And people are always saying, oh, listen to the science, and it's based on science. And so forth. Well, what science? I mean, there's, there's only scientists. And scientists are essentially curious people, hopefully. And science is not about finding answers. It's about finding better questions. And so, you know, that's very frustrating to me. Um, and as I said before, the only way I can think of to, to handle these situations is to do a, the, the best job I can explaining, you know, the, the, how the planet works and, and reminding people, you know, that CO2 is the most important molecule next to water and that everything of life is made from CO2. I mean, somehow CO2 has gotten this bad name, like it's poison, you know, but CO2 is a miracle molecule next to water. <laughs> and um, so that's the only thing I can think of is to really do a really good job trying to explain things. And, um, and I am going to, you know, I have gone back to all the original papers and I'm going to include that in the film the same way that I included papers in the Symbiotic Earth film. So, but, and, and I'll, so I'll try not to rant too much. <laughs> and my narration, I think that, you know, I, I use things like irony um, to make, to make the point and, um, you know, hopefully it'll, I'll calm down by the yeah, time. No, no, I, I'm sure you'll uh, work that out. Thank, thank, thanks a lot for that answer. We've got a, a David McConville. Uh, who's going to be part of our series uh, actually on Earth Day uh, on April 22nd, has his hand up. David? Hi, thanks, Bruno. And hi, John. Thanks for that hi. wonderful presentation. Um, I, I'm glad to see you drawing the connections to the biotic pump and Yene and Kravchek, all of these characters that are doing so much amazing work around this after your Margulis film. Um, and I actually had a question sort of related that I think Lynn touched on in some of her literature um, early on, but it's, a, it's kind of about the universalizing tendencies of something like the Anthropocene and the ways in which, you know, understandings. Um, and like, for instance, you mentioned corporate colonization, but if you go back further than that, from a historical perspective, the dissociations, the lack of relationships within, you know, management of places, uh, largely caused by colonizing processes, which were very anthropocentric. And, and you mentioned regenerative agriculture. And what I wanted to highlight was that a lot of the, the problem, I think, with the, or the, the challenges with these solutions like regenerative agriculture that are, are emerging um, are highlighted in things like the, the dynamics between the films. I don't know if you know, Kiss the Ground and Gather, where Kiss the Ground is mostly like you know, white wealthy landowners that can go in and they have epiphanies about soil where Gather is looking at indigenous land practices. And of course, a lot of the statistics around indigenous land management and biodiversity are well known. And, and I just wonder in terms of the film and how you're looking at this, like what's the kind of the cultural and social lens that you're taking? Because so much of the agroforestry practices and what we call regenerative agriculture are traditional land management practices, you know, like that, that is feeding the world as you point out. And our misconceptions around this are so intensely framed through this kind of universalizing understanding of, you know, man's impact on the world when it's actually very much looking at kind of, you know, these sort of industrial colonial approaches to, you know, industrialized food production and land management. And is that something that you, you get into in, in terms of like, not just the biophysical, but sort of the biocultural uh, approaches to how to address some of these things? Um, I do get into it, and um, I spent a considerable time learning about farming in India, um, and there's amazing work being done in there, um, and I talk about traditional farming, and they have a, a new technique, um, zero budget natural farming, um, and um, we touch on, so in, in terms of regenerative agriculture, I kind of make a uh, make the point that of all the places I visited, 
whether it was India or, uh, you know, the, the, the regenerative agriculture up here where I live in near the Hudson Valley, in the Hudson Valley, or whether it was uh, uh, community gardens in the Bronx, um, and um, whether it's that in California, um, I, I put them under a big envelope and just saying they all have certain things in common. And the common things are, um, one, they look to nature for their solutions. They use cover crops. You know, I go through the solutions. Um, and we do talk about the fact that, um, that, and I, know, I, I, you know, the wording is important again, but that there have been plenty cultures um, who have figured all this stuff out and have lived sustainably uh, on the planet. Every one of these, you know, longer than we have, every one of these forests have people living in them um, who have lived there for a long time and done just fine. Um, I also make the point that they may not have lived totally in harmony with nature. We don't want to idealize them. But one thing's for sure, they lived a lot more in harmony than nature than we do. And so I try to group them together um, in terms of this mindset of looking to nature for solutions, and the solutions are all there in nature. Um, and to, to remind people that, um, you know, this regenerative farmer here in, uh, you know, the Hudson Valley, he didn't come up with these ideas. You know, even Steiner, you know, biodynamics, he didn't come up with those ideas. Um, so it's all accumulative from the past. And when I spoke to the Indian farmers, um, you know, they were drawing on tradition, but building with new science, new, new understandings. So um, I, is that, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I know, especially a lot of the innovations of Deb Dabal and similar Indian farmers are doing, they're just doing remarkable work. And so that's great to hear that that's something that you, you get into. Thanks. Well, I, I, uh, uh, I haven't quite worked it out yet, but I want to say something about Sir Albert Howard. And I want to say something about, well, so, you know, it's really amazing when I was out filming the Indian fields and realizing, oh my God, these guys are way ahead of us in the, in the U.S. in terms of regenerative agriculture. And you see a guy out there, you know, out there in his loincloth with his little bitty plow, you know, and then his cell phone rings. And it's just this wonderful image. And I want to put in the film somehow that, you know, I was in good company um, because Sir Albert Howard came to India and thought he was going to teach them how to farm um, and found out that they were the ones that were going to have to teach him. Um, so, you know, that's a part of the film. Superb. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we've got with us, we've got James Shapiro, who's uh, actually one of the stars of Symbiotic Earth. Oh my God. Uh, James, are you there? You put a question up on the chat. Would you like to come forward? <laughs> well, it, I'll, I'll read James' question on the chat. It, he, he just asked, how many people recognize H2O is more important than CO2? Is the number of people who realize this growing? Hi, James, if you're there. Uh, thanks for for listening. Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, I, I think that intuitively, and you know, remember, one of the things that Lynn Margulis always said was that a lot of science is common sense. And I think intuitively, if you explain to people that water, you know, is a cooling process, and that think about a hot, you know, think about a hot day and the rain starts to come, they'll, they'll understand that. Um, but I think that CO2 is 
uh, that most people do not get the, the, the water factor yet. So CO2 is winning. The, the chapter in, my, in the film is called, How Did CO2 Become the Fall Guy? Hey, Curtis, you, you've got a question on the chat. Would you like to uh, jump in? Sure. John, thank you. This has been, it's been a fantastic talk. Um, I'm curious in the research that you've done for this film and in the filming, if you've encountered any places where the forests haven't been lost or you know, that they've been able to maintain, uh, uh, I guess the space is the, the, the forest system or if there are places that have created forests where they didn't exist before? So, um, there are these maps. I know you can't see this, but the old growth forests, if you look at where the old growth forests used to be um, on the earth, um, for instance, in North America, um, they were covering all of Canada down on each coast, and there's an area in the middle which is clear, and all of that is gone, but kind of the, set, well, the northern part, there's a strip that's left, okay? And the same is true of the other big old growth forests, the Siberian forest, there's a little bit left at the top. Um, and um, in the Amazon, we know there's still some in the center, right? Um, and uh, and, the, and in the Congo, when you look at the map of the Congo, there's just a few dots. But so those theoretically are old growth forests that haven't been destroyed yet, okay? Um, in terms of planting forests, it's tricky because there have been lots of efforts uh, particularly in Sub-Sahara Africa. You may have heard about they were going to plant a million trees in the green belt. Um, the idea of coming in to the desert, you know, really, and trying to plant trees, it just hasn't worked. Um, and the, this, this, the failure rate is astounding. You know, 80, 90 percent of the trees die um, because you need an ecosystem. Um, you need an ecosystem For, to build the forest. So, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. You can't just plant a tree. You've got to have an ecosystem, but you can't have an ecosystem without the trees. There is one, uh, um, there, you know, there, there are hopeful uh, signs. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, but there is, a, oh God. Um, I can't remember his name, but a man who has who was working in uh, Niger, um, and he planted a lot of trees and they didn't succeed. Um, and then he realized that the roots of the trees, the old trees, were still there, and there were stumps that were growing out of those, um, and with with little sprouts growing out of them, and. If you carefully prune those trees and just let the center or the strongest of those sprouts grow, those trees will rejuvenate themselves. And he's had quite a lot of success doing that. I wish I had my notes so I could find his name, but I don't right now. So, um, but, um, but the effort to, to, to grow uh, forests is still very important. And it's, and you know, the best effort might be to kind of push the areas back. So if, if only the center is left to start reforesting from the part that's there toward the area that was deforested. So you're kind of growing the forest back out again so that you kind of have an ecosystem to work with. Hey, if I could jump in, this was something my classes were looking at last semester as we studied forests. And I think it's a character in, in the, the overstory, which is now going to become a TV series, Richard Powers' overstory. Yeah. But I think it's the science character, Patricia Westerford, uh, who says in that novel, it's something that's perfectly true, 
the, the, the easiest way to bring a forest back <laughs> is to do nothing. And also the Volaben in his uh, Secret Life of Forests, basically just don't continue to presume that man knows best how to jigger some ecosystem back into, uh, into functioning, but just clear out, leave it alone. <laughs> And, and you know, and 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 the landscape will regenerate the, the same way it's done, you know, uh, over the over the uh, the lifetime of Gaia. Uh, but it's you know, but it, the, the political hassle or or just the but that's how do you get us humans to like lay off <laughs> to leave uh, places that we now consider well, you know, they're they're. We own the place. Uh, you know, I was just, I was going to mention to John as well that um, I spend a lot of time in the Basque country in northern Spain. And there are these old growth beach forests along the mountains. And, but a lot of those have been cut back over time um, for uh, tree farming, which is in, in those, they've planted the California pine and have harvested that over time. But because of some blight that has come through, that pine is slowly, you know, uh, dying back and the beach is coming back, right? So I think that, I mean, there's, a, there's the economic side, you know, I think that Bruno is talking about that, you know, that, that's keeping people from allowing thing, the forest to come back. But then there's also the natural side, which, well, you don't really have a choice. Those California pine aren't going to, they're not going to continue to grow with this particular disease, but that beech tree is, and that's coming back. And so you're starting to see the expansion of that old growth. Huh. Um, that's interesting. I, um, this man's name, who I couldn't remember, his name is Tony Rinaldo, R-I-N-A-U-D-O. A very interesting story. Um, and about how he's done that. I mean, nature is incredibly resilient. Um, and um, ecosystems, you know, contrary to what you hear about ecosystems being fragile, ecosystems are by and large incredibly resilient and robust. I mean, if the ecosystems on the earth were fragile, we would have destroyed them a long time ago. They're incredibly robust. And so there's a lot of hope in that, um, that, that life can come back. and. You know, it's not so much that we have to leave it alone because there's, as it is that we have to watch what it does and support it in whatever it decides to do because it it knows better than we do. She, if you'll allow me to go so far. <laughs> uh, Aviva Gold, go ahead. Hi, Aviva. Hi. Hi, John. So I'm a former neighbor of John's. Um, many years ago, I, uh, I lived in New York State on the dirt road, the back dirt road in the forest where he lives. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned how um, most uh, farms that, were, um, that are growing because trees were cut down are not so much um, vegetables and stuff that people can eat, but for other, you weren't clear. You didn't say livestock. You didn't say for feeding hogs and feeding beef. And um, I was one, and I realized that can be controversial also for people that are not vegetarians who love to eat meat to put that in the film. But are you going to mention that, that how much, uh, trees are cut down to grow things to feed meat and if we ate less meat that would also help or you're not going to go there at all oh i go anywhere um so yes i, I didn't <laughs> okay. i didn't i didn't go into that the commodity crops are absolutely to feed to feed animals a lot of them are to feed animals a lot of them are for energy um and a lot of them go into food but they don't go into what we call food. 
They go into the industrial food system to make industrial food um, into the industrial system. Um, and so I make a little caveat that that's not really food. Um, and I do have a whole chapter about nutrition. Um, the question of, of livestock is, is very interesting and very, uh, very you know, controversial. Um, the, um, um, the Amazon right now is being cut down mostly for cattle farmers. So we, we understand. Um, so that's a terrible crime. Uh, um, and so, yes, th that in itself is a problem. Um, but on the other hand, um, free range cattle and cattle rotation um, in, in open graze lands um, and is very important for the soil and a very important for climate change. And in fact, one of the principles of regenerative agriculture is in, that you incorporate animals. Um, so that's a plus on the animal side. On the other side, of course, are the factory farms that we have in this country, the, the CAFOs, um, which raise animals in these prisons um, and feed them corn, which they shouldn't eat anyway. And then they have this incredible outgassing of methane. Um, and that's a terrible problem. And it's a complicated conversation because, of course, methane in and of itself is not a problem. Um, and the, you know, the, the belches of cows are full of methane, but there are plenty of bacteria that just eat that right up. And it, it, so that's not the problem. But when you have these factory farms, which have these cesspools, um, um, which is just the methane is the bacteria probably just it's too much for them. <laughs> you know? They just go away. Um, so I don't, you know, um, I think these are all things we look at and I, and I'm, I, I don't know how much I'm going to go into that. Um, but I do hope that, that at least if people start thinking about this, um, you know, they can have an engaged conversation about it. Nice okay, to see you, Eva. Nice to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Same here. Eva. Um, if I could jump back in, I was really intrigued by your remark about scientism. You know, I mean, out here in West Texas, <laughs> you know, we think the problem is science deniers. Uh, the not 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 the people that are uh, you 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 New Yorkers might think that uh, the problem is people uh, invest too much faith in science as as possessing the truth, um, but but that's just I mean, goes to show the 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 sort of pathologically polarized nature of our of our discourse. I mean you, and and it's not like the scientists. And I know James. I, I think James Shapiro would back me up on this because Lynn, you know, this was one of her constant arguments that that that. Um, you know the the certain kind of science cultivated its its sort of you know uh, hallowed uh, uh, status as as the you know they know the truth uh, and and science will set you free because <laughs> they've got the truth uh, and so so it's either all or nothing right. Um, so, but I don't know, at, right at the moment, I don't see scientism as the major problem. Uh, but um, I well, mean, it, what do you think? <laughs> well, um, no, scientism itself is not the major problem. But so I discovered a book, Evidence-Based Climate Science. And it's a textbook. And it's got incredible articles. It's got some of the, and it's a collection of papers, basically scientific papers. Um, it's got some of the best articles that are talking about uh, CO2 and the role of CO2 um, and so forth. And, but as I read it, 
or as I looked into it on the web, I realized, oh my God, these people would be called deniers, right? These are the people who we're not supposed to listen to because they're climate deniers. Well, they're not really climate deniers at all. They're just doing the same thing I'm doing, which is to say that CO2, they deny that CO2 is the sole cause of climate crisis. Um, and so we have this dogma set up by, you know, people we all respect, um, or at least I respect them, and some of the greatest advocates of, of, uh, of activists, rather, are, you know, pushing this point that it's all about CO2. And if you don't believe that, you're a denier. Well, that's just terrible. And it's kind of the same thing that happened in evolution. That, you know, if you, if you didn't believe in, uh, 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 you know, kind of the, the, the neo-Darwinist position, right, then you were somehow a denier of, of, of evolution, you know, which is absurd, uh, looking back on it. But uh, so the same thing is happening now. So that, that's what I really am up against. Um, the, the popular scientism, you know, I think that's mostly in the media trying to simplify things. Right. Um, that sounds and, right. Certainly, the and you know it's the, the scientist. All the papers I have read in the scientific community, um, you don't find many scientific papers that really get it wrong. The papers that do the modeling, the important papers of Manaby and Weatherall that talk about CO two, um, they go right into the fact that they're not going to include water, um, and they explain why. And they have caveats that basically say this is a model and the models we have to simplify the variables and there's a line in there i could pull it up where it says you know don't take the quantitative results very seriously <laughs> but of course everybody takes them seriously because they don't read the papers actually but you know so it's a it's a complicated situation um and uh, and it's true that to reduce it down to scientism is perhaps a pretty broad brush, but, you know. So if I might put a final point on it, not seeing other hands at the moment, uh, I, I think, and this is a, a discussion that's all through symbiotic earth as well, but the deficit, the kind of the cultural intellectual deficit if you wanted to just sort of encapsulate it, is the deficit in systems thinking. So we're, we're not, we're still, uh, and, and the cyberneticians like Lovelock from back in the day and Lynn and, and, and their, um, and you know, the, the whole, uh, I mean, there is a robust tradition of systems thinking, but still it's a minor, minoritarian view. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and, and uh, Mainstream, uh, well, anyways, the mainstream view is is linear and rationalized, and uh, and and we're just stuck uh, uh, with with a dominant a dominant narrative that doesn't allow us to put the pieces together. That would be my <laughs> yeah. that's my well, rant. Uh, but you've been exploring this problem, and and I'm sure it'll come out in in the film. I. Uh, I've been think, I think about this a lot, and this will be my last bit here. I think about this a lot, and um, my mantra at the moment, and, and it will be in the film, um, about systems thinking is everything causes everything else. Um, and I've been, I've been, so there are going to be graphics in the film, but I'm trying not to make them too scientific. Uh, I mean, not too much like a science film, right? But um, I keep thinking of what is the image of the, these these networks, which is the system, right? And um, and I keep realizing it's not the network of a, like a network of a train line 
where you have one thing leads to something else, it leads to something else, it leads to something else. But rather, since everything in nature cycles, everything cycles, it's a network of circles. So I just want to share something with you. Um, this is a... Uh, Um, can you see that? Oh, yeah. So this is a graphic from a, a Indian, uh, actually, I, I don't know if it's, uh, it's not a mosque, but it's probably, it's an Arab, uh, uh, it might be a mosque. I'm not sure. I'll have to look into it. But anyway, this is a traditional um, Arab uh, Islam uh, diagram. And you see that this network in the center here, um, it's all circles. It's all made by intersecting circles. All of these things are circles. They're, they're a little, they're actually 12-sided, but call them circles. And, uh, and so, but this creates a network. Um, of all these intersecting circles. So I'm thinking of using that as an image um, to, get, to get across uh, this idea of, a, of what it is, what it means to say that everything causes everything else. Hey, it's nice. And our friend David McConville over here has a kind of a radiating sphere. Uh, uh, version of uh, uh, systems within systems, you might say, uh, interconnecting uh, in a network or or through um, uh, through embeddedness uh, as well. All right, I think we're good, John. Fabulous, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. When do you think it'll be done? Uh, what's the problem? Well, I like, I, I think the end of the year. Um, okay. I, I, I'd like to be able to start showing a first cut to, to, you know, maybe in October. I don't know, you know, um, it's, it's huge. And, um, but it's not going to be two and a half hours. So um, it, it's, you know, I just don't know when it'll be done, but soon. Hey, well, we'll be happy to muster an audience for you when you're ready. Well, you hopefully I'll be able to come down there again. Yeah. You know, in, in person. That'd be even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, wanna take us thank home? You. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, a big round of Zoom applause again to John Feldman for such a great conversation tonight. Very engaging and a great extension of so many ideas we've been pursuing all year. Um, and thank you so much to Bruce Clark for moderating and hosting tonight. Uh, please go ahead and go register for our next event, March 4th, a conversation with Christopher Merrill. And uh, follow us on social media. And as always, my great thanks to the Humanity Center's Executive Administrative assist Assistant, Justin Hughes, who helps us get everything set up. Uh, stay warm and be safe, and uh, we'll see you in March. Have a good night. Bye-bye.